the answer to the addiction aspect of my story is a lot easier, where I, I sort of had a, mo a moment of, I can't think of any better way to describe it than grace, um, where sort of that veil that I was talking about um, between me and the fact that I was going to die. So just for a little character background, um, I am 21 in this scene. It's my first day on the job. I'm a full-time college student, and I had very nice parents which is always the first question people ask. You can still ask it to me later if you want. Um, an hour can be a long time. Hell, a minute can be a long time. The minute before your first kiss is a painstaking collection of seconds, each one more bloated with anticipation than the last. The first minute of a tattoo is a long one as well. Pain has few rivals in its ability to slow time. Fear, excitement, elation, these are kissing cousins, all with the sensorial power to render each second humming with every tick and gasp of our bodies, the whir of insect wings and distant car engines. Sometimes I could savor these moments, relish them as opportunities to walk straight into the fact of being alive. In the seconds that crept into the minutes of my very first domination session, I had no idea what I wanted. The $75, certainly. But beyond that, character building life experience. I would have confidently named these motives right up until the moment that the latch of the door of the red room closed behind me. With that clasp, all bravado and ideology dimmed with the light of the hallway behind. It was only me, a naked man, and 60 minutes of palpable expectation. An hour alone with a naked man with whom you do not intend to have sex can be a very long time. On my second shift ever, and after only Mistress Bella's example, I teetered over my first client in a borrowed pair of seven-inch platform stilettos, anxiety, and a corset that cinched my waist six inches smaller than nature intended, confined my breath to the shallow region of my chest. My bosom literally heaved, straining against its lacy contraption and obstructing my view of the man who knelt at my feet. Cold tears ran from my armpits. The darkness smelled of stale incense and the briny tang of bodies past and present. It was hot, and the red walls seemed to breathe slightly, as if I were inside a great belly. Despite the fact that I was high on heroin, I felt only fear. It snuck up on me as I stepped into the room, and my confidence lifted like a flock of startled birds. I couldn't stop thinking about my mother. What was I, my mother's daughter, doing here? It suddenly didn't make any sense. But that's what the drugs were for, to keep mom out of moments like this. Narcotics create distance, and I only needed an inch to turn away from that question. I knew I had to say something. My mouth was gummy with 99-cent lipstick from the all-night drugstore down the block, and opening it, I prayed that the waxy paint would bear some talismanic power and bring the right words to my lips. Mistress, are you all right? I felt his breath on my fish-netted knees and fought the urge to back away. Yeah, I croaked. My gut, displaced by the corset to somewhere near my bladder, clenched in panic. I itched to turn and slam the door behind me on this naked man and the pulley tests affected to camouflage his entitlement. Everything about him, from his hunched back to the quaver in his voice, was a demand phrased as a question. But I could not fail at this. Much as I wanted to flee the shadowy room, my own image in the mirrored walls and the Inquisition-style cage that dangled from the ceiling. My urge to escape was met with an equally familiar will to persist, and it was this second urge that had both rescued me from failure and damned me to finish every game in which my hand was called. Language had always saved me from ever being arrested, attacked, caught in a lie, or with my pants down. I would not allow words to fail me now. I will spare you what I did end up saying after that. Um, so this is a pretty good sort of illustration of the beginning of this experience for me. Um, you know, and, and as I mentioned before, I grew up in a really loving home that was not entirely conventional, but it is through no sort of great trauma or self-hatred or abuse situation that I ended up in this situation. I very much sort of chose it, um, partly because I was always sort of a person who was motivated or enthralled by um, secrecy and secrets. Um, and this was very much sort of a secret world that existed in great contrast to the rest of my life. Um, and it felt really empowering in the beginning. I mean, it felt very terrifying in the very, very beginning. Um, 
but I definitely came to understand it pretty quickly as an empowering, defining experience. Um, so I'm going to read one other relatively short section um, that kind of illustrates where I went quickly from there. I had never liked parties. Even as a child, I tended to form intense one-on-one -on -one relationships rather than groups of friends. Unless there was dancing, I didn't see the point of hanging out in a large group, which made it impossible to connect with any single person and triggered a shyness that I liked to hide. I also typically wanted to get so high that public locations were impractical. At a party, I might have to share my drugs or talk to someone who'd care that I'd forgotten how my legs worked. After a few months of working at the dungeon, however, my interest in social events spiked. I now had the power to hijack any conversation, to commandeer the attention of however many people were within earshot at any given moment. As far as I could tell, no one was immune to the curiosity that the phrase, I'm a professional dominatrix, provoked. I lulled happily in the silence that followed uttering it, knowing the torrent of questions that would follow, the shine of eyes that saw me suddenly knew. Knowing I was likely the sole spokesperson for a subculture most people would never experience imbued me with a confidence that I otherwise lacked. I was the reigning expert, the beautiful geek, and I loved their shock at how normal I seemed, how unlike what they would have imagined. With this ace in my pocket, parties became fun. Whether I pulled it out or not, I still had its power and took comfort in worrying it like a lucky stone. On Halloween, Rebecca and I went to a party in Dumbo, an up-and-coming Brooklyn neighborhood full of industrial lofts and brick streets, where I was supposed to meet a date. With a vial of cocaine, three bags of heroin, and a disposable syringe folded in a sock inside my purse, I convinced my roommate to take a cab and had her laughing the whole way there. The giddiness of anticipation always made me funny. I had her in stitches with my description of Jean, the sweater man, who brought a duffel bag to the dungeon every week full of knitted clothing. He liked to be completely swathed in sweaters. Sweater socks, sweater underpants, sweater mittens, sweater hats, sweater trousers, sweater masks. When he had nary an inch of naked skin bared, I'd immobilize him with rope bondage. And that was it. He liked to be tickled sometimes while bound and sweater mummified, but really just being sweaty, sweatered, and bound was enough for Jean. I could just hang out in the room while he gently writhed and cooed in his fuzzy cocoon. Jean made an ideal anecdote, ridiculous and benign. I also wanted to distract Rebecca from any nervousness I might exhibit in omitting the fact that I had a purse full of drugs. I'd become more comfortable omitting things from her, though I suspected she knew more than I told her. We both felt the distance that my lies created, and with increasing frequency, I would catch her looking at me with worried eyes. I'm not sure I'd ever known a feeling more invincible than that of walking into a party feeling beautiful, with drugs in my purse and a double life everyone was dying to know about. I've seen the girls who feel this way walking into rooms. They are irresistible. One can't help looking at them. Their smooth hair and self-conscious hands, their eyes bright with secret joy but they are so delicate in their preening and their need. I fear for them now, knowing what they might do to keep that joy from trickling out of them, as it always does. So, my date said a few hours later, and I could see him wanting to ask. Go ahead, I smiled. I'm sorry, I just, he ran his hand through his hair. I've never known anyone, and you seem so normal. Yeah, I mean, kind of. So you don't, like, have sex with them? No. This was always everyone's first question, and they keep my clothes on. I felt a pang of annoyance at his visible relief, if only people knew how predictable they were. So you do, do you do it because you're into it? No. More relief. It was important to defang myself first thing so that people knew I was safe to question about it, assured that I was just like them, only a little braver. After those two questions were out of the way, they always relaxed and became more eager for details. Were I into it or willing to have sex for money, I would have been less of a curiosity, easily consigned to a diagnosis of diminished intelligence, psychology, morality, or class. I understood this and even shared their logic, though it irritated me in its unexamined narrow-mindedness. The last thing I wanted to be mistaken for was into it. The glory lay in my ability to do it despite not being into it, in having the courage to choose it based on curiosity rather than compulsion. 
It's an acting job, I said, shrugging. Probably one of the most reliably paying acting gigs in New York. He chuckled. They always did at that one. Um, so I'm going to stop with the memoir there. Um, but this is a pretty good example of something that the book sort of tangles with a lot, which is this tendency and, and I think a sensible tendency to sort of build a story around our experience when it's indigestible in some way. And I think we do this about our childhoods, we do this about our love affairs, um, and sometimes we do this on the page. And you know, I was talking with Suzanne about this earlier, but I think that that's a very natural sort of impulse of the psyche to sort of fashion our experience, especially hard experiences, into a story that we can live with, that we can carry around for the rest of our lives comfortably, right? And not be irritated by it all of the time. Um, and I think that there's nothing wrong with that, that it's how we survive. But as a writer, I don't think I have that luxury anymore. And I certainly didn't in the writing of this book. I definitely um, had to sort of peel back the layers of the narratives I'd built around what this job was, around who I was, around the nature of addiction. I mean, I think addiction, I don't know if anyone here has experience with it or loves someone who has experience with it, but it's very much requires sort of the drawing of a certain veil between you and certain truths about what's happening in order to protect your secrets and your experience. Um, and so for me, and you know, the story is very much about my experience as a dominatrix, but it's also about my experience as an addict and of recovering from addiction. Um, and so sort of while it was happening, it was very much about pulling back those veils. And then when I wrote the book, it was another series of sort of pulling back the veils to really look at what it had meant to me. And it was not at all what I had thought, um, which is usually the case, I find. Um, so something else that we talked about um, after dinner was um, the importance as a writer of challenging yourself and of when you get comfortable with something, you know you're good at something. We all like being good at something. We all like being recognized for that. But to push yourself outside of that comfort zone and do something that you're not yet good at or you don't yet know the answer to. you know. And I think Jerry and I both talked about the writing process as a process of questioning, you know, of, of interrogating our experience um, and our subject matter, whether it's in fiction or poetry or memoir. Um, so that's very much been my experience lately. Um, you know, and the memoir is a pretty straightforward sort of narrative. Um, and, you know, it has a chronological timeline and it's, it's definitely realism. Um, and lately, my writing has taken sort of a, a sharp turn, which was really scary at first because I like to know what's going to happen, like we all do. Um, but I had to sort of grope in the dark to find where my work has been going. Um, but it's rewarding, you know? Um, I think it's terrifying until you arrive there, and when you arrive there, you're so glad that you let yourself be scared, you know, like so much of life. So I'm just gonna finish by reading some passages from um, a new essay of mine. And it's called Call My Name. I mean, in it, I'm very much sort of moving back towards some of the interests of mine when I first started writing, um, which were in language and image and in writing the memoir, and I think always in writing memoir, or if you've ever written personal essays, um, you have to be brave and you have to work really hard to get to the biggest truth about yourself. And it's not always pretty and it's not for everyone. Um, but you definitely have to, I think, in a lot of respects, try to do that as directly and as lucidly as possible. Um, and I tried to do that with this memoir. And I think I did to the best of my ability. Um, but there are other ways of getting at even bigger truths through sort of poetic elements. And that can be even scarier because it's less clear as it's happening. Um, but I think I found myself sort of searching for that truth through sound. Um, an image and language more so than um, transparent narrative. Call my name. When I was seven, my sea captain father at sea, my mother a strobing lighthouse of missing, I stood alone in my bedroom, renaming all my toys Melissa. You and you and you. A child's narcissism, maybe. A punishment for my dolls. I didn't choose my name, but I could choose to give it away, a small triumph. But no matter how many dolls I christened Melissa, the sound of my name still shocked me. Hum of M, soft L, hiss ending open mouth. Melissa, my teacher called each morning. Here, I flinched. 
It was a ribbon of sound, a yielding, sibilant thing. Drag it along a scissor blade and it curls. I wanted a box, something whose corners I could feel. Zoe, Katrina, Natalie, those girls ruled the school bus. You could press your fingers into Melissa. It was hum and ah and s, more sigh than spit. On family vacation in Florida, after days pickling in the hotel pool, eyes pinked from its blue brine, my mother asked me, Melissa, why, when the ocean was steps away, why the pool? Because the pool has sides, I told her. I was already spilling out, grasping for edges, and what chance did I stand against the ocean? How many times had the sea taken my father and left her beating the shore with her hands? It was an early lesson. The ocean disappears things. It is a hungry, grabbing thing. In its deep, there is nothing to reach for. Next to it, I was a girl gulping a woman's grief. Jean Piaget believed object permanence to be learned within the first two years of life. That is, a thing disappeared continues to exist. But what if it never appears again or disappears long enough to learn to live without it? By two years old, I had already learned two fathers, one addict, one sea captain. My birth father was Tom, a name like him, just a man. The captain had two names, Robert for the merchant marine and rounder Bob for his intimates. Bob, so close to dad. Both taught me how to watch someone leave and not chase them. When I asked my mother why Melissa, I already wanted a new name, Jackie, Britt, Tina. You could drill a hole with Jackie, slingshot a rock with Brit. Even Tina could hurt somebody. Melissa was bringing that ribbon to a sword fight. Melissa was leading with my softest part. My mother told me that it was Tom who chose my name. Or did I already know that when I began hating it? A word shapes the mouth with want and wonder for its object. By six, I knew that Jessie down the street fit her name. Fast and blonde, Jessie was a streak of girl, hook of J, dot of I, bare teeth of long E. It is no wonder that to hold Jessie in my mouth came to feel like holding Jessie in my mouth. On her knees on the bedroom floor, Jessie pressed two naked dolls together, clicking their movable parts. What are they doing? I asked. You know, she said, and I did, so I told her. I named the sex parts I knew, and she repeated them back to me. Those strange sounds turned in the space between us, and they were ours. I used to repeat words under my breath, on the way to school, in the bath, chanting their sounds until they detached from meaning. The moment when those sounds fell free of their object, like the moment the swing hung horizontal to its frame, the body weightless, just before gravity clutched it back, giddying. It unlatched something in me, the proof that anything could be pulled apart, could scatter into dumb freedom, a bell ringing not for dinner or church or alarm, but for the simple pleasure of making it ring. Any word could be shaken like a crumpled skirt, motes of meaning swirling into minuscule autonomy. Just as Jesse and I chanted those words, unlocking the riddles of our bodies, I chanted my name to teach it meaning. My favorite book was Salinger's Franny and Zoe. Like Franny studies the way of the pilgrim, I was mesmerized by the idea of incessant prayer, Franny's incantation of a set of words, the Jesus prayer, in hope that their intention would syncopate with her heart's beating, the surge of her blood turning even the mysterious work of her organs holy. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, goes the prayer. Jesus was a cool guy, the captain said but religion was not. The nuns who swung wire hangers against him and his brothers were not. My abuela had made them kneel on rice, a Bible in each hand. She told them to be good, to pray, to beg the help of no one but God. My abuelo had beat them senseless. Help never came. Praying to Jesus was not for anyone in our family, but I loved the word mercy. The idea of falling to one's knees moved something in me that I tended like a secret. So I left out Jesus, have mercy on me, under my breath, on the way to school, in the ripped back seat of a white Subaru with a hand up my shirt, waiting to detach from the meaning of my daily life, to feel the blooming quiet of something holier. Even those ancient monks, writers of the Philokalia, believed that the repetition of words and willingness was all one needed. Faith could be summoned in the self, in the saying, in the body, one didn't need to believe in God, to walk toward God. 
I had only to believe in a word, so I started looking for it. I'm just gonna read one more short section. Something drew taut in me at 12, and by 14, it snapped. I said yes and no at all the wrong times. Yes of my thumb jut over Route 151, summoning the open door of an unknown car. Yes with a lighter flame held to anything that would burn. Yes to my friends, older brothers, hands and brothers, friends, hands, yes, yes, yes. Is anything wrong? No. I changed my name from Melissa with an I to Melissa with a Y and a single S. The double S had been a liability. That soft middle, all those curves. The small I, I'd found a way to cut it out of me. Melissa was unmoored, like the dinghies in the harbor that got hijacked by local boys and abandoned in the marsh grass, or left knocking against a far dock, oarless. An X or a K or a T would have been ideal, but I settled for Y, not barbed wire, but rope. Melissa, with that Y, would stay tethered. In the United States, approximately 17,000 people change their names each year. And in nearly all states, a person cannot choose a name that is intended to mislead. But what if one's given name is misleading? Melissa made promises I didn't want to keep. Melissa with a Y lasted one year. I still occasionally find it printed inside the cover of a book. The first feeling is shame. Because I wanted to change myself or because I thought it would be that easy. Thank you so much.